So what I wanted to start with, since this is a panel about choice, is uh, a little bit about the broader technical environment. And to note that um, there is an axis forming between the technology industry and the research industry. Um, and I think that that's something we need to think about as we think about the learning healthcare system because there's a very good chance that we'll inherit the norms of the technology system as it is brought into the, into the healthcare system if we don't think about it and, and have some intent. So I wanted to start this at church. It's here in Detroit, actually, very close. It holds 2,000 people. Um, I have chosen this because um, up until a couple of years ago, this was the size of the largest longitudinal uh, Parkinson's disease research study. Um, and it's good to have a mental model of just how few people that is compared to technology uh, because Google A-B tests advertising on the state of Nevada versus the state of Utah. Right? That's the scale of the technology industry. And it's that scale that a lot of people desperately want as they try to bring technology into the research process. Um, this is the way the data are collected in that particular Parkinson's study. I'm not singling it out. It's just because we've done stuff in Parkinson's, so I know it well. So there are two data collection points per year. Uh, one of those is in person, the other one is by phone or by survey. Um, that's an incredibly thin sample size, right? From a generic uh, perspective, 2000 is a tiny sample size. And two data collection points per year is an incredibly sparse data sample for a disease that is chronic, degenerative, and deeply affected by lived experience um, and, and perspective. Now the opportunity, the reason that this access is forming is that we can use phones. This is from a study that we run at SAGE. Uh, we enrolled 9,000 people in the first 24 hours that we ran the study. And we can quantitatively measure the phenotype pretty well, right? These same sensors that give you landscape and portrait give you tremor. In your pocket, they give you gait, right? Tapping on the screen gives you dyskinesia. You can do memory tests. You can do all sorts of feedback like Warren talked about in, in his, his app from 10 years ago. And you can get these samples twice a day, every day, as long as people are willing to give you their data and do the work. Right? This is why the axis is forming. It's incredibly powerful. You can start to see individualized trends in people's lives as well as cohort level trends on literally a daily basis. You wake up in the morning and there's a fire hose of data waiting for you. Um, this led Apple to the launch of the Research Kit framework. We were part of that. We were definitely the only nonprofit that was involved in that. Um, and there's a reason why they got into this, and there's a reason why there are more than 50 apps out into the wild that we know of already using the framework, and it's because this immediate way to access people, right? Instead of mailing them surveys, you can push surveys to their phone, and most of the time they answer them as long as you're engaging them effectively. And it's not just Apple, right? Google has launched Project Baseline. Uh, how many people here are familiar with the Baseline study? Great. So they spent three years designing this watch and a sleep sensor. Um, they are going to enroll a million people. They're going to do blood samples, genomes, phenotypes, sleep and watch, right? And all the data will be owned by Google. No data goes back to individuals, nothing, right? This is going to be a completely private study, and they have the money to do this at a scale that has usually been the province of governments. Um, and the problem with this are the consent norms to me in, in many ways, right? So in technology, Right? The only thing you ever consent to is giving them more. Right? That's the norm. And working with these companies, you have to move them off a normative process, which is why shouldn't we get all of the data and never give any of it back and never engage with people? Because we're going to give them products for free that, may, that balance out the value part of the risk perception. And if we don't think about this, we're going to get run over by it because it's, you know, these, the size and the scale and the power of these technology companies is something that is almost like geologic time. It's really hard to express how powerful they are. Um, this is from this morning. It turns out that one of the things they do to track us around the internet is they run what are called replay scripts. So this is a replay of a uh, person who w visited Walgreens. In order to serve her more effective advertising, her entire visit was recorded in a cookie on her computer and later broadcasted to a set of third-party vendors who help people understand how to do marketing. In this context, she selected abortion and alcohol dependence as her two issues. This was sent unencrypted. This is the culture that, that we live in, and this is the culture that we're going to be offered in part of the research enterprise. Right? And the problem with consent that technology companies exploit is that we don't read very well on screens. Right? Physiologically, it depends on whether you do uh, eye gaze fixation or time analysis, we read one out of three words maximum in print, sorry, on screens compared to in print. 
right? That's if we attempt to read it, which most of the time we don't, right? We've become cultured to clicking OK on contracts that are between us and our goals on the internet. Um, this is not an accident. Right? This is intentional. It's to keep us from paying attention to the terms, right? Now, this creates opportunities, though. So the nice thing about uh, electronic informed consent, which is where I spend the vast majority of my time, um, is that we're taking a really lousy in-person interaction where you're handed a form and not expected to read it, and we're given an opportunity. And so despite these technology companies jumping in, right, the existence of the regulatory friction is an opportunity, but only if we come in and we talk to a certain extent the language of the technology companies. If we can encode our norms into some products and designs that they recognize, then in many cases, they will adopt them. And so I'll show you what we came up with. So we spent uh, two years doing qualitative interviews supported by AHRQ, Robert Wood Johnson, Helmsley Charitable Trust, uh, Academy Health, looking at informed consent as it transitioned into uh, an electronic context. And these are the two biggest findings. One was that everyone thought it was lousy and wanted it to get better, but nobody felt like they were able to change. Everyone felt like they were trapped by the default forms of their institution, their IRB processes, and their lack of agency as researchers. But everyone wanted it to work better. I mean, literally everyone we talked to, from database administrators to patients to clinicians to IRBs to lawyers, wanted informed consent to be more informing. And that was the opportunity. We said, okay, we can use technology to inform people, not just you know, hide things that we don't want them to read. And so what we came up with was the idea of creating interfaces to informed consent documents that were pedagogical. So uh, we have, we know empirically from research in, in web journalism that the combination of an on-task photograph, a headline, and a subheadline is engaging. It slows down the participant's experience to the same speed that it would be if they were in print. It doesn't work if the picture's off-task, interestingly. So the thesis is it's the cognitive load. Um, there's a navigation to another layer that has more information. Um, we work really hard on the language of these screens. This is actually one of the worst ones we wrote from a flesh kincaid readability scale perspective. Uh, we now, in all of our apps that we are pushing out this year, everything is at the fifth grade level on those screens. You can also use things like videos on these screens, animations. You can provide hyperlinked access out to information sources and let people navigate to the level of detail that they want. And of course, the only place you can go from this screen is back to the main screen so that you see the icon, headline, subheadline combo again, because if you wanted more information, then probably it's good to reinforce that through the interaction. Um, we pair this with uh, either a summative or a formative assessment. We don't want people to just swipe their way into a research study, even if it's a low-risk study. Um, in the beginning, everything we did was summative, which meant you had to get 100% right on the quiz to enter the study. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with participants and we've decided to move that to a formative assessment. In Parkinson's disease, some of our participants couldn't control their tremor enough to answer the questions right, for example. So now we have a formative assessment where we say, you got you know, four out of five questions right, do you want to proceed or do you want to go back and go through the educational experience again? And what you get is this narrative which, you're, which the participant sees before they ever touch the document. Because again, we know statistically it's unlikely that they will read it, and if they try to read it, that they will probably not process all the words. Um, so you go through this, you, you cannot get to the consent document until you get through the narrative. Um, it takes anywhere from 2 to 15 minutes, depending on how fast you go through, how many screens you navigate to, um, to get through this on a general basis. All this went through uh, our IRB, uh, which we, as an non independent nonprofit, we work with Western IRB. Uh, but it's now been through the IRBs at 26 research institutions as, as a way of doing consent for low risk studies. The other thing we do, and this, I'm, I'm, and I apologize, I'm terrible with names, but the first speaker today talked beautifully about the problems with individual consent. And we've tried to actually allow an escape route, which is you can donate your data to broad consented studies and broad reuse. Um, so we make this an option. We do not set a default because defaults prime people to choose the default option. Uh, but 70% of the, of the enrollees across all of our studies select broad sharing of their data. Now we have a biased sample, we run on mobile phones, right? We understand all of this, but it's an, it's an impressively persistent number across conditions that we study at least. We don't expect the data users to read our terms of service either. 
Um, we do teach the participants about the choice through similar screens here, qualified researchers, shareable data. We don't just put data on the internet. Um, the data users have to go through a designed process as well. So we sat down and we said, if we're going to let people donate their data to science, we need to have a process to vet the data users because one breach of trust from a data user will destroy this entire system we're trying to create. So uh, these are transaction costs we introduce in front of the data to reduce the predictable misuses or misusers. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about the right combination of these and we decided that uh, strict identity validation uh, was an important part of preventing sort of anonymous attacking, harassing, trolling, doxing behavior. We make them pass a test. So it's a 13 question sort of LSAT style test about using uh, human data in the cloud. It's an annoying process, that's the point. We want people to get through who are motivated to get through. Um, and if you are not willing to take a short test, you shouldn't get access to data. Uh, and then the data use statement, which is nice because we discovered participants really want to know what uses are happening. They'd like to be able to be notified, scroll through them. And then this is the last piece, which is that an oath tends to actually help people adhere to a contract that's hard to enforce. So everyone, has to, everyone wants to use the data in the system, has to download, print, sign, scan, and upload the oath. And again, we use uh, user theory from legal contracting, real estate. There's a reason they make you initial next to things, and it, because it increases the odds that you look at them. So we have these nine points that they have to sign. This goes on their publicly identi identified validated profile. Um, and now what we're doing is trying to give away all the methods. So we've given away all of the icons, the design files, workflows, because your app developer will write you an app that starts collecting data the minute it's installed, not the minute people have consented. And so we try to provide some support for that. They will also do things like tell you that they've added full birthday to your uh, study uh, so that you can send people happy birthday notes. Um, they'll do that 72 hours before you go to IRB, generally. Um, in, in hopes that other people would pick these up. We didn't want them to have to work with us to do this because this is just a methodology, it's a process. Um, and we've got at this point, uh, we've enrolled 100,000 people across the studies that we operate at SAGE. Uh, as far as we know, there's been another quarter million enrolled using the visual layered consent method in studies that we're not involved in. Um, and Apple actually put it into their research kit framework. So there's a value in having a design and a product that encodes your norms um, as a competitor, right? It's actually something that, that even these giant technology companies can actually wind up being vulnerable to in a way that is, is good. Um, so I'll finish with this since we don't have a ton of time. Um, so we've heard a lot about all of us. Uh, SAGE, my org, we're the awardee to work on informed consent as well as on shepherding clinical protocols uh, as well as doing some digital health sensor work. Um, we're looking at, at really blowing up the interactions. So we, we think we should take the existing content, make it available via chat. A lot of people who have feature phones, non-smartphones, would like to interact through a chat interface or an SMS interface. Um, we've heard from a lot of people that would like to see all this content just as a video that they can watch. So we're in the process of working on both of those things. But I wanted to show you some of the wackier ideas we've got and hopefully get feedback. Um, so this is how design works, right? You start with basically a Pinterest board. Um, one of the things we're looking at is a sorting hat. Can we sort people who have clean ACMG results from people who have a clinically actionable ACMG result and give them different experiences before they access their results? Or do we need to give everybody the same experience? All these slides will be available, so I'm going to go fast to stay on time. A ballot box. A genetic counselor will frequently provoke you with statements like, did you know this about DNA, this thing that, you, that is unknowable, this thing you should be uncomfortable with? Are you comfortable? Do you want to know more? So the idea is that we provide statements that are designed to be provocative and uncomfortable and let people assess how comfortable or uncomfortable those statements make them, give them a score at the end and say, no, now that you know what you think, do you want to go forward or not? Um, a game, right? There's a very powerful way of, of orientation through gaming where you can demonstrate knowledge of an environment by playing and completing a game. We're looking at all of these things. Um, Stampy Cat, this is something we, uh, that I think is, if, raise your hand if you know what Stampy Cat is. No Minecraft parents? There we go, couple, <laughs> right? He has 6.1 billion views of himself playing Minecraft. And it's a way to teach Minecraft that has taught my six-year-old son how to play Minecraft with no instruction. And we are ignoring it as a pedagogical tool, right? For not just for kids, but for adults. And then my favorite one, which is my last one, the Kobayashi Maru, which is uh, from Star Trek. I'm not a Trekkie, but this came up. Um, so you put the participant in the shoes 
of the actual study coordinator and they have to make choices about benefits versus risk, harms versus outcomes, and let them see the trade-offs that are involved and say, now knowing this, do you want to proceed? Do you want to be involved, right? Put them into your shoes instead of trying to sort of game them through a system, right? This is the way we have to think about choice because if we don't offer choice interactions like this, um, we're gonna wind up with studies that look like the, uh, the arthritis study that came out from GSK over the summer where there was an 11 point document in PDF form that you could either click or not, right? That's where it's coming because the speed, the depth, the velocity of the data that's available is so attractive to the scientist that they're actually pretty aligned with the company's norms, not with research norms. So, you know, out of all of this, the, the main thing is don't sort of stop by thinking and writing a paper about how we ought to do things. Try to start designing things that encode your norms. Because those designs can take off and scale in ways that the paper will never do. And please contact me. Thank you.